Hey guys, I bought the Ultimate Processor from 2012. This is a Intel Xeon with 12 cores, 24 threads and it cost a whopping 2,614 US dollars. I bought this processor for only 44 US dollars. So let's put it on the test bench and see what it can do. So to test this processor, we need to put together a test system. And here are some of the core components. Let's take a closer look and I will go over them in some more detail. Let's begin with the highlight of this video. It is of course the processor. This is nothing other than Intel's Xeon E5 2697 V2. This is from the Ivy Bridge 22 nanometer generation and it is the best processor that Intel produced with 12 cores and 24 threads. The base clock is only 2.7 gigahertz, but it can turbo boost much higher. Depending on the load, anywhere from 3 GHz to 3.5. One highlight is the large cache that the CPU has. We have 3 MB of level 2 and 30 MB of level 3 cache. And you will see that I believe this is actually making quite a big difference in gaming performance. In 2013, this processor cost a whopping 2,614 US dollars, absolutely insane. And I bought this from AliExpress. I paid 44 USD or 69 Aussie. And unfortunately we have another 10% of import tax, but still to get this top dog processor for 44 US dollars is pretty cool. Next, we need a main board and this platform is called X79 and you have a couple of options. You can get OEM workstation machines, you can get retail main boards or you can buy new main boards from places such as eBay or AliExpress. And what these manufacturers basically do is they uh, desolder or remove chipsets from old uh, parts and build brand new main boards. And this is one of these boards. It's the Plex HD X79. I bought this many years ago and it is a really nice motherboard. The highlights are LGA 2011 socket. We're getting proper quad channel memory support. A heap of PCI Express lanes directly connecting into the CPU, which is something you get on these workstation platforms. It has a post-diagnostic LED as well as power and reset buttons. However, there are some downsides. This is not a retail main board, so warranty will be sketchy. The documentation is lacking. There are no BIOS updates. You're getting only a single SATA 3 port. All the other ports, all the other remaining ports are SATA 2. And this particular main board has a quite flaky USB 3 implementation. So I ended up using a PCI Express USB 3 controller to copy, star, uh, to copy data around. The ports are also quite basic. We're getting PS2, USB 2 with 480 megabits, USB 3 with five gigabits. We're getting a gigabit ethernet controller and audio ports. The VRMs are also nothing special on this main board. It has some basic cooling. This is not something I would recommend for overclocking, but that's not what I'm doing. I'm happy to get stock performance out of this processor. The X79 platform is now almost 10 years old and most people have moved on to X99 for some cheap fun. That platform uses DDR4. Here we're still using DDR3 and that means RAM is really cheap. I wouldn't even bother with 16 gigabytes of RAM because RAM is so cheap. Go with 32 or 64 gigabytes. We're using 32. This is a quad uh, memory channel kit with four eight gigabyte modules. They're running at 1,866 megahertz. Also, this platform being a, uh, being a workstation, it supports ECC registered memory. So it's better at detecting or avoiding memory errors and more stability with having many RAM modules installed. These new X79 main boards from AliExpress can boot from NVMe SSDs. We're using a Silicon Power A80 SSD with one terabyte. For cooling, we're using a heat pipe cooler. We have four heat pipes and a 90 millimeter fan, nothing too flash and does a perfect job at keeping the temperatures in check. And as you know, uh, especially those following the channel, I don't use thermal paste anymore 
For many years I've switched to thermal pads to keep things neat and clean and consistent and also worked really well in this project. And guys, we have a new video card on the channel. I sold the GDX 1650 that I've been using up to now. This is the NVIDIA Quadro M6000, a very special video card. It is the workstation equivalent to the Titan X. So it's a step up to the uh, GDX 980 Ti. And there's more, it has 12 megabytes of VRAM. So that means we can do better testing of such platforms without having to worry about being bottlenecked by the video or the VRAM. And for power, we're using an Asus Tough Gaming 750 watt PSU. Works really well. The only downside is it's not modular, so a lot of thick cables. I also have some power consumption figures. This is with a power meter at the wall, measuring the entire system. Sitting idle on the desktop, I saw 48 watts. Running Cinebench R20 on a single core, I saw 87 watts. And running Cinebench R20 on all 12 cores and 24 threads, the entire system pulled 144 watts, which is actually not that much. And now it's time to test the system. We're using the latest version of Windows 10, including running all the Windows updates through the internet. And then I'm downloading the latest drivers for the NVIDIA video card. This time I've tested more games than ever, but also let's check out Cinebench because it makes for easy comparison. In R15, we're getting 1,563 for the multi and 120 for the single core result. In R20, we're getting 3,195 for the multi and 248 for the single thread test. And finally, in R23, we're getting 8,205 for the multi and 644 points for the single thread test. And now let's check out some games. I made the decision to test all the games, not at the very highest detail setting, so we're not testing at ultra, but at high or very high, depending on what the game had to offer. And this is because some of the modern games, despite the Quadro M6000 being a really good video card, it is still quite old and some games will be held back by the video card. Anyway, let's start with Dirt 3. All games are running at 1080p. This is one of my favorite racing games and it runs around 300 FPS. Absolutely beautiful. Strange Brigade using the Vulcan API is also a game I really like testing on the channel. Look at that, comfortably over 100 FPS. You have to be happy with that result. This is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. At 1080p, we're getting around 80 FPS. This is also very nice. And here we have Doom. Uh, in Doom, you can choose OpenGL or Vulkan. We're using the Vulkan API at 1080p, comfortably over 100 FPS, getting close to that 200 FPS uh, engine cap. Now, these games run fine, but they are a little bit older. Let's test out some more modern games. Cyberpunk 2077 running at 1080p. The built-in benchmark result gives us 50 FPS on average. That is a pretty decent result, but this is a game that will definitely struggle on this platform. Horizon Zero Dawn, I saw around 60 FPS most of the time with some dips below, but I think this is still a very good outcome for this platform. And another modern game, we have Death Stranding. This game was released for free on Epic Games, so of course I grabbed it. We are using the default settings uh, there's a preset and we're getting over 60 FPS and this game seems to be running perfectly fine. Sticking with Epic Games, I try to pick up all the free games whenever they become available. So I thought, why not test out some random games and see how they perform. We have Train Simulator 2, never played it. Um, here we are getting, yeah, under 60 FPS and not sure if it's a CPU or a video card issue on this platform. If you're familiar with this game, please let us know. GTA 5, here it depends a little bit on the graphics settings. So I dialed it in with the high details and we're getting around 100 FPS and the game runs perfectly fine. The Spectrum Retreat is an interesting looking game. I didn't play too much and it seems to have VSync enabled and runs at 60 FPS locked. 
Stranded Deep seems to be an interesting survival game. I didn't survive too much, but wasn't quite sure what you need to do in this game. I don't have too much time playing games and we're getting around 100 FPS. So another game that runs well on this machine. Borderlands 3, this is running at the start of the game. I'm not sure how representative that is, but anyway, we're getting just over 60 FPS. So that's also another game that runs well. And this is The Surge, a interesting game. I haven't played it too much, but I kind of like the graphics and the, the look and the feel of this game. And we're getting around 100 FPS. So this Xeon is a pretty good processor, but does it run Crisis? It sure does. Here we have Crisis and we can see that the game mostly uses a single thread, but in combination with the Quadro M6000, Crisis runs pretty well on this machine. So this was the video about the Xeon 2697 V2 and yeah, I'm really impressed. Most of the games it runs pretty well. Now, if you're into high refresh rate gaming and maybe you're playing online games with huge maps, I think this CPU is not for you and you might be better off buying something more modern. But if you're a little bit uh, on the budget side and like to uh, make a bargain, then this CPU might be for you. And it's definitely heaps of fun, cheap fun and more interesting than modern CPUs in my opinion. Lately, I've been picking up a ton of free games from the Epic game store. I think I've got 50 games or something like that. And such a CPU is awesome for playing some of these old games. And those games are fully patched, uh, well documented. There are walkthroughs. You usually get the DLCs as well. So this might be an interesting processor for such projects. And it's also a very special feeling of having the absolute best, the ultimate CPU from a certain generation. Most of my past projects are usually value or budget oriented CPUs. So with the Xeon processors, I like to pick something that has a good balance between cores and uh, decent clock speed and doesn't cost too much. But lately I've been looking at the high end, the top models with the most cores, large cache, and they might not clock as high as some of the uh, other CPUs. But in many games that actually doesn't make too much of an impact. The large cache can compensate to a certain degree. And also it means productivity. If you're doing some video editing or rendering, these old CPUs can still be relevant to this day. The X79 platform doesn't get much love these days. Most content creators have moved on to X99. There are lots of videos out there, but it's still fairly decent. You can still get main boards out there on AliExpress and eBay. And because it uses DDR3 memory, the RAM is cheap as chips. Don't bother with 16 gig, go straight to 32 or 64. The cheap RAM is one of the highlights of this platform. I will try to find links for some of these parts if you wanna go shopping. And remember, you don't have to buy main boards from AliExpress. You can also buy OEM servers slash workstations you just have to make sure that it's compatible with the Xeon V2 range uh, these are from the Ivy Bridge generation if you find Xeon processors interesting I will put two videos on the screen for you to check out and please share your thoughts what do you think about these Xeon processors do you have a workstation at home or maybe one of these main boards from AliExpress share your comments down below and if you haven't subscribed to the channel please do so and I shall see you soon with another one.